on his way. Devil is on his way. Devil is on his way, motherfucker. Oh, the devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Fall to your knees. Devil gonna make you pay. Fall to your knees. Devil is on his way. Motherfucker, you gonna... Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey, y'all, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. <laughs> and I'm Dylan. <laughs> I wasn't sure where you were going with that. I wasn't sure either. <laughs> uh, how oh, are you? Well, I would ask how you are, but I'm not sure we need the answer to that. Uh, I'm doing great. Same answer as always. I'm well. <laughs> nice. I'm well, considering. Wow. It's kind of cold and crappy outside, and this ra- is- it's been rainy for days and days. This is one of the cleanest cleanest openings to an episode we've ever had. It gets dark so <laughs> early now. Uh, winter sucks. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of excited about some cooler weather, but I hate the shorter days. Yeah, it's so gloomy out. Yeah, if you're if you're not an abdominal snowman, an abdominal bull, but snowman, you're not gonna enjoy it, right? <laughs> Yeah. Is that like a snowman with like a six pack? Yeah, it's an eight pack actually. Like the Yeti, he's like wearing a tap out shirt and he's really into protein shakes. Well, you know, he had that bad, that nasty divorce with uh, Margaret. And, uh, you know, he was just trying to reinvent himself. I see. You know? Okay. Yeah. Dylan, there's been a lot happening in the world of true crime, it seems, uh, the last couple of weeks. And, of course, we have missed some of our <laughs> midweek episodes to catch up. But one thing that I wanted us to talk about, because it's been such an enduring mystery, solved finally, you've heard of The Boy in the Box. I have heard of The Boy in the Box. Now, if you're not familiar with The Boy in the Box, it's such a sad story. It was a boy whose naked, extensively beaten body was found on the side of Susquehanna Road in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, back in 1957. The boy appeared very clean. He was groomed, recently had a haircut, trimmed nails, but he had these horrific physical injuries before he died. Multiple bruises on his body. He was malnourished. He had scars. Um, Some of them were surgical on his ankle and chin, but the police believe that his cause of death was homicide by blunt force trauma. So for years, he has been known as America's unknown child or the boy in the box. How, that's just so horrible. Because of the advancements in DNA technology, Dylan, they have finally been able to publicly identify this young boy as Joseph Augustus Zarelli during a press conference that was given just a few days ago by the Philadelphia Police Department. 65 years It is taken for this child's identity to be brought forth. That's amazing. But, and one of, uh, I think it was Allison in our Discord said, uh, it was either her or Angie, said he finally got his name back. So I think that's a very, um, that's a good thing. But uh, as far as I'm to understand, they're not really that much closer to um, solving the case. Not a whole lot of new information in that regard. Well, it was through the use of genetic testing and investigative genetic genealogy that they were able to find um, this child's identity. Sources state that he is the child of a prominent family in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. And so authorities are using that information to further investigate and search for suspects. That's very interesting. It will be, I think something we need to follow and try to figure out if, you know, if any uh, more news comes out, um, solving this case, suspects named, we, we got to follow it. Yeah, I agree completely. It's a, it's an interesting case from a true crime standpoint. And I would imagine, um, would you say 65 years, 65 years, 65 year mystery. So there's going to be members of that family that this brings uh, some kind of an answer to. I, I'm guessing most of the people who knew the boy uh, and close direct family are likely dead, right? I mean, that's a long time. And uh, so, yeah, that's just very strange. 
And we have missed a lot of true crime news, but I, I, I want to speak on the one thing, one of the things um, that stood out to me, and this is quite a bit old in the fast world of the interweb, but the Debbie Collier case, um, they eventually came out and said, in their opinion, they already held this opinion beforehand, and they got the you know all the uh, toxicology and everything back, full report on the autopsy. Um, she, uh, they're saying suicide and, and that just struck me and Heather as, uh, at first we were just like, ah, oh, there's no way, you know, it can't be someone's killed her. Why would they think that? But it actually, when you take a step back and think about it, it explains everything. It explains why she goes in the dollar store and buys these random items. And, and then, you know, however few miles down the road, you know, something happens to her. So I I just thought that was a very strange case. And uh, the more I've thought about it, it's a strange way to harm yourself. I think that's another thing that had people like, oh, it has to be murder. It has to be this and that. What do you think about that case? And now that for as as far as we know, all the information's out there. Well, I think I'm no expert. So I'm going to take. Other expert opinion oh, wow. on the matter. <laughs> hot take, hot take. I know. Um, I mean, I don't think it's so far fetched because people who are willing to to go forward in that direction with self harm um, maybe aren't always in the. I'm not going to say the right state of mind, but the most reasonable state of mind. Yes. When they're at that edge, right. Therefore, what she did may seem super random and bizarre to us, but for whatever reason, it made sense to her at the time. Yes, that's a good way to put it. You know? Um, and there was the odd cryptic text to her daughter, which all, you know, a lot of people thought maybe her daughter might be involved. Well, then What's it made me think of maybe she was trying to set it up so they would get more life insurance or... oh. I, I my first thought was she's I mean, having a know. she's having some kind of a mental episode well, and a break she was from reality. Having some sort of break from reality. I did not consider the fact that she may be able to try to mask her suicide to make it look like uh, at the hands of someone else or accidental to uh, improve life insurance for the family. Uh, I didn't even contemplate that point. That's a that's a good point. I mean, that's a lot to do and go through, but. It could have been an th- inner thought process. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, I was just trying to throw ideas at the wall. Well, no, that's a good one. They stick. Again, I, I think we can't get into the minds of someone who's maybe at that point. So right, and it's sad. Things that don't make sense to us would make sense to that to the person at the time. Okay. And I also think a lot of folks who are um, at that edge, it's any means necessary. So if if that includes some very bizarre method of um, taking yourself out, then they may do that. Well, and, and for me, and we'll move on, but for me, that's what kind of supports some kind of significant episode or something, a distorted thought process that um, th- this is, I need to do this for this reason, this way. And, and it's kind of an odd thing out of the ordinary as far as, methods people unfor- unfortunately used to um kill themselves i mean maybe there was something else at play like she didn't want her family to know she had done, done this to herself and try to it make it be, look like a murder thought it might be easier for them to accept if someone else did it to her gosh i mean again it's, I, yeah it's tough i guess i don't really have a whole lot to contribute to this conversation well, it's just I, I've, <laughs> it's just it, it's so strange i've seen a lot of strong opinions on it and and i've trying to and and i had been thinking about the case and um, it seemed very strange anyway it just something seemed off and uh but yeah okay so let's move on and see where we land today are you ready dylan we have been discussing kentucky cases at least so far <laughs> in the month of december And I have a case here that is very bizarre. Again, I'm using that word a lot today. It is so unusual. It's just almost unlike anything we've covered before. And not that we haven't covered a serial killer, but I think just this guy's whole story is 
we have to talk about it. And he does commit crimes in Kentucky. He has ties to Kentucky. Okay. But not all of them are in Kentucky. So we will be in another state a bit. That's but okay. I, promise I will be bringing it back around. We're going to come back to Kentucky. to Kentucky. Are you in the mood, Dylan? <laughs> I was born in the mood. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's do this. Let's go. Leslie Irvin was born April 2nd, 1924, in the Rosedale section of Evansville, Indiana. On his birth certificate, he was originally called Henry J. Irvin, but having a change of mind, his parents decided to name him Leslie. His middle initial was listed as B, though he was not actually given a middle name. Do you th- now that happens sometimes? Do what do you, what's your opinion on that? The letter for the middle name. Would you go just no middle name? I probably would just go no middle name. Okay. Rather than just giving someone an initial? Yeah. Because I mean, what does that mean? Well, and then they always have the follow-up, well, it's no, it's just the letter. So, yeah. I'm and then say- when you really think about it, I mean, what's the point in giving someone like a middle name? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's some history behind all of this, but if you have a first name and a surname, then why do we need like a middle name? Or like six names. It's always interesting to me to look up those things as to why we have this saying or what started that. And so, yeah, that would be cool to look up. Well, his brothers thought Leslie was a girl's name. So he ended up going by the nickname Bud as a little child. Which I guess the B, they took that and turned him from Leslie B to Bud. Oh, man, I didn't think about that. You could have all these different names that start with that letter. And you could just use it in different situations. I'm You'd be Batman. like, I'm, I'm Leslie Bartholomew. I'm Batman. I'm Batman. I'm, okay. I'm Bond. Leslie Bond. <laughs> Something like that, right? Yeah, exactly. As I mentioned, Leslie had siblings. He was the sixth of eight children born to Edward and Alice. He attended Howard Rusa Elementary School, where he was considered a good student, though teachers would say he was mischievous. Would teachers call you mischievous, Dylan? I don't know. I just talk too much. I know people can't believe that, but uh, I just talk too much at inappropriate times is what was described to me. Is that when you would get into trouble at school, it would be for talking? Yeah. Bullshit and fucking around with it. I'd finish my work very fast, very quickly, and uh, then I would just uh, piddle around and like fidget and whisper to people and ask them questions. Yeah, I got in trouble a lot for talking. Yeah. Talking too much. And now we podcast. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, yeah, yeah, take that. Third grade teacher told me I wasn't going to mount to nothing but a hill of beans. Is that what your third grade teacher said? No. It's a real self-esteem downer. <laughs> no, I did have a teacher one time. Cat would keep making fun of my last name. Like, I don't know why. And he was a cocksucker. Dude. This, this was like my teacher I didn't like. That stands out for me. Just make fun of your name. His name was Mr. Lee. Right. (laughs) Oh, wow. (laughs) Don't get too exciting there. Mr. Lee. Uh, And he was uh, Caucasian, to to be clear. He was was L-E-E. It would have been cooler if he was Asian and his name was Mr. Lee in my book. But this guy was just an asshole. What, like, how would he make fun of your name? Now I'm invested. Well, one time, um, this is a proper derailment. It's full on. Um... One time he wrote Dylan Pecker on the board. Pecker? Yeah. And I'm thinking that he was thinking like it's funny if his name was Dylan Pecker and he just had like a Freudian slip and really wrote it down. I don't think he was trying to do that. But uh, everybody laughed at me and pointed. But you know what? I took the name and I embraced it. I will be Dylan Pecker. Like, you wish you were Dylan Pecker. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I leaned into it. I I do wish that. I do. Yeah. He was a sensitive child who would cry if teachers scolded him. Les, which was another name he liked being called, got along well with other students. It wasn't until he started high school at Boss High School in 1938 that Les seemed to change. During this time, he had five separate... Well, I'm going to say this. During his time in high school, five separate fires were started, and they were all determined to be arson. Oh. Okay. So the person was called the Boss Firebug. Very, very creative. 
And police began making more frequent visits to the school, doing security types of checks, keeping an extra eye on certain students. Yeah, hey kid, why you got that can of gas and a handful of matches? Exactly. So it was during one of these checks that a freshman was caught trying to start a fire. When the fire was extinguished, officers questioned 14-year-old Leslie about why he had started the fire. He told them it was out of boredom. He said, quote, I don't know what came over me. I just wanted the excitement. No damage had been done, so Leslie was let off after a stern talking to by police. So in their eyes, they just caught him trying to do this, or they're not pinning the other arsons on him. That's what it sounds like to right. me. Right. Now, when I was in, I'm going to derail. When I was in the eighth grade, we had a full-on arson at our middle school. Oh. Two girls from my class, one of them who happens to be like a distant cousin, but we don't really claim her because she's still a delinquent. <laughs> even wow. After all these years. So dedicated. Yeah. She was smoking in an art closet along with this other student. Full of paper. And they decided to throw <laughs> like their cigarette butts in the trash can that did have a whole bunch of paper in it. So I think it was determined that it was not like they intentionally set this fire, but you'd have to be a fucking idiot to know, to not know that if I throw these cigarettes into this paper, it's going to likely ignite Yeah, in a closet full of uh, paint and paper. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it burned down an entire building. Really? We had to be evacuated. So they couldn't stop the fire and it just destroyed a, a whole building. And it was a very old building. I think it was like one of the original buildings in the school is pretty old. It had been built in like, I think the early 1900s. Oh, wow. So it just like totally went up. It was this old, like two or three story brick building. But I remember sitting in science class watching Bill Nye the Science Guy. Hey. Fire alarm goes off. This is not a drill. Exactly. And they ushered us out to the football stadium and we sat in the bleachers and watched the building burn. Oh, wow. Until our parents were able to come get us. Uh, was it, um, okay, was there just a small tinge of excitement that this isn't a drill and it's real? Or was it scary? Or It was scary. Of course, I, I mean, at the time we were all very concerned about safety and is everybody out of the building? Is everybody okay? Are there injuries? We were worried about our friends, our favorite teachers, that kind of thing. But then I think after that feeling sort of dissipated and we learned that everybody was out of the building, that it almost kind of became like this. Fascinating. Like almost kind of like this weird hidden excitement. Like, yes, the school is burning and we'll never have to come back again. <laughs> nice. You know? Right. But so if happened. everybody's safe and no animals are being harmed, um, this is kind of exciting. A little bit. Right. I just remember people whispering like, we're never going to have to come to school again. This is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, you don't, it's not often you get to see a structure burn. I mean, honestly, it's happening. You don't want it to happen, but um, it's interesting to me. of course, me. I think me, being the like dork that I am, felt sadness because it was like this very old, like the historic building is burning. Oh God. And like being sentimental about, you know, like that's the building my grandma went to high school in. You're such a dork. I am. Oh, my because gosh. Because I was like, oh, that's sad. It's like a cool old building. All right. So he's had a brush with the law. He's a little shithead. They have got, you know, I'm sure they contacted parents. He's in some trouble, but they kind of let him go on his way, right? They do, which not always a good thing, Dylan. No, no, but uh, what can you do besides suspect him in the other five arsons? Bust his little ass. <laughs> in 19, I'm just going to say, Leslie needs his ass beat. Okay. He needs a proper whooping. He needs a whooping. Yeah, he's a bad boy. In 1939, Leslie started his sophomore year, but had little interest in education, so he dropped out soon after. Leslie accepted a job as an industrial firm clerk. At the time, it was not unusual for children to leave school and get a job, especially if they had large families. They were sometimes expected to help support their parents, their brothers and sisters, and pay rent, pay bills, what have you. I think we should let child labor come back. <laughs> You're terrible. Well, we need them in the workforce, let's be honest, and it will teach them some valuable lessons. You're horrible. Not in industrial you settings. You just like set on getting us canceled, Dylan. Well, uh, not industrial settings or dangerous jobs, to be clear. But if they're industrious uh, youth, 12 to 15 years old, let them work, bro. Like Get them a job. Administrative jobs. Where yes. They where they have little ties and suits on. papers and yeah. 
file. Even customer service. Could you imagine uh, some customer service person being an eight year old talking shit to you? An eight year old be like, "You butt face." <laughs> yeah, be I like, "I'd to help you." Look, you're stupid. I'm you're not up. my mom. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. I'm listening. You're not my mom. I can't get anywhere with this AT and T customer rep. I swear. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I'll cry about it, and then they just hang up on. <laughs> oh you. my god. Leslie wasn't the most solid worker, though he was listed as an employee from 1939. Not much appears after this, though he will say he later worked at least three years with the industrial firm. The I don't know why I did it defense would follow Leslie as he would continue to commit crimes, mostly thefts, breaking and entering, and various misdemeanors. Only a year after quitting high school, Leslie was sent away for his various transgressions to White's Indiana, um, I'm sorry, White's Indiana Manual Labor Institute. It's a mouthful. In, I think it's called Wab- Wabash? I think it Wabash? is. I think it is Wabash. Yeah. He was listed as 15 years old, but he would actually turn 16 two weeks after arriving. So only out of school for a short time, and he's in a state institution and we've heard about these places before charles manson many other criminals get their young start in these sort of reformatory reform school boys homes yeah. boys and girls homes and they're not they're not good places carl panzrant panzram famously was likely turned into the monster he became by these various places of this and back in this day too. Yeah. And they were very, I guess they were unregulated and just, uh, the kids were kind of just thrown away there. And, uh, it, it seemed like it, we've talked about this before, these types of places, asylums, these reform schools and all that seem to attract to a certain degree, sadistic people because they know they they have these people or kids in, in vulnerable positions and they can do their, you know, be mean to him and treat him like pure shit. After his release from Whites, Leslie returned to his parents' home in Indiana. In 1943, Leslie enlisted in the U.S. Army, according to records. Private Irvin was assigned to be a paratrooper and was sent to Camp Mac- McCall, uh, or Macall, it's kind of a weird spelling, uh, near Hoffman, North Carolina, Dillon. Had Leslie seized the opportunity to learn an exciting new skill, he could have changed the course of his life. I mean, he said, after all, he was looking for excitement. What's more exciting than parachuting out of planes? Well, yeah. Right? Right. The Army would offer travel and training, after all, but Leslie didn't see it that way. Being in the Army wasn't keeping Leslie on the straight and narrow. Only about three months after enlisting in February, uh, we're up into May now, Leslie went AWOL. He was found soon after, returned to camp, and they sent him to the stockade. He escaped but was quickly discovered once again. This time, he was tried for desertion and plopped into the pokey at Fort Benning in Georgia. He was able to escape from there on June 17th. Daggum. They can't lock nobody up proficiently. Leslie's like, y'all, y'all can't lock me. You can't keep me in chains. You just wait. Okay. This guy's like Houdini. Really? During his time in the army, Leslie had stayed connected with his childhood sweetheart, a woman named Pauline Alma Wagner. After escaping from Fort Benning, he got in touch with her once again, but did not tell her the whole truth of what had happened. Leslie convinced her to join him in South Carolina, where they were married in Chesterfield on July 4th of 1943. They lived together for three months, but Irvin was in pretty hot water after leaving the military twice. The marriage went south rapidly, and by fall, so only a couple of months later, Pauline had returned to Evansville without her husband. Though she was living with her mother, Pauline was still using the last name Irvin. She worked at an upscale department store, having quit school before graduating. Um, Her parents had divorced, and Pauline was helping her mother out financially. By 1944, she was going once again by her maiden name, but I could not find information about whether she ever actually divorced Leslie. Oh, okay. And, And that happened, especially back in the day. Sometimes people just didn't file the paperwork. On October 1st, exactly, 1943, Leslie was locked up at Camp Breckenridge near Morganfield, Kentucky. Six days later, he managed to disappear again. Although he was captured and returned, Leslie broke out again on October 24th. 
damn, it's like Leslie Copperfield up this bitch. true. This time, Leslie made the unwise decision to return home to Evansville, where he was immediately rearrested. He was locked up again on November 1st, but managed to escape that same day. This time, he was arrested in Indianapolis by the city police and handed over to military police who brought him back to Camp McCall. He escaped again on November 24th, deciding North Carolina wasn't where he wanted to be. This time, he went to Boonesville, outside of his hometown, and he was able to stay there for a couple of nights undetected. January 6th of 1944, Leslie was caught by the police chief trying to steal a bicycle. He was walked to the jail, but able to pull away from the police chief and run. <laughs> walked walked to, to the jail. Walked him to the jail. I like that. Boonesville was a small town, so when locals heard the commotion that this prisoner had escaped, about 50 people formed a search party to find him. He was found hiding in the garage at a car dealership and recaptured. Once in custody, he told the police chief he had been stealing bicycles then selling them to make money. The army was contacted, but by now they were done trying to mess with Leslie, so they told the judge to just go ahead and handle the bicycle theft for now. So they don't even want to follow up on charges with him. The army is just like fucking over it, bro. Right. And, <laughs> and I can imagine it doesn't take a lot for them to just be like, we don't even want to hear that guy's name. We don't want to think about him. Well, the fact that he's just continued to escape their custody. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't look that. That doesn't look. That's not good luck. Along with other prisoners, Leslie began examining the best escape route from the old Warwick, Warwick County Jail. Together, three men, including Leslie, were able to scrape and dig a 24-inch hole through 20 inches of brick and mortar into a wall. The escape was quite the story in Boonesville. And there was a young man in the cell with them who did not escape. And the next morning, of course, when the police chief arrives and is like, what happened? He said, well, I didn't want to run away. But I was afraid if I called out for someone to help that they would come back and, right. you know, attack me or something. Yeah. And the police chief is like, well, if it was that important to you, it could have just come out the hole and around the side and knocked on my front. Because I guess he lived next door, <laughs> like knocked on my front door and told me that he like escaped. I mean, come on. And the I boy mean, was just like, I didn't think about that. Well, yeah, I didn't want to go outside my <laughs> cell because if I get caught outside my cell, you're going to say I'm escaping, dude. Nice yes. try, bud. I thought it was just kind of a funny situation. You could have come and knocked on my door. I'm right there. You know? You could have done come told me. You could have come let somebody know something. Once on the run again, Leslie returned to stealing for cash. He was arrested for selling bicycles and using a fake address and name. The bikes were taken from Princeton High School, mostly while students were in class. Again, this guy, I mean, what a fucking shitbird. What a shitbird move, dude. Still Go steal a bikes from kids. School kids while they're in school. <laughs> while they're trying to do something with themselves. Yeah. Irvin then sold them at garages for fifteen to twenty two dollars each. I wish I could get a bike for like fifteen bucks. That was a score. In April of nineteen forty four, Leslie was sent to Camp Polk in Louisiana, where he was eventually dishonorably discharged, and they sentenced him to twenty five years at a rehabilitation center in uh, Bowie, Texas. The sentence was reduced to 10 years, but that didn't matter to Leslie. By July, he had camp, um, he had fled Camp Bowie and headed for the Midwest. So once again, you can't hold him down. Man, I would, uh, you think you would ever be that talented at escaping? No. Me neither. I think I'm too out of shape. Yeah, well, there's that. I'm not going to fit through anything. And it just seems like a lot of work Yeah. to escape. It does. He finished out 1944 being arrested two more times in Kentucky. He was arrested first on grand larceny charges and handed over to the Army for final imprisonment at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Marion County, Indiana. He was there only a few weeks before escaping and heading right back to Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> on November 11th of 1944, he was arrested for stealing war bonds and jewelry, totaling about $3,200. He was also suspected of stealing a car. Louisville police tried to turn him over to the army once again, but they were just like over dealing with this dude. 
So instead, the Army turned him over to Indiana officials for prosecution. Irvin was formally charged with first-degree burglary, uh, burglary for a slew of robberies in Marion, Hendricks, and Shelby counties. 22-year-old Irvin was tried and convicted. He was given 10 to 22 years in Indiana State Prison. He began his burglary sentence on January 12th of 1945. While there, he was evaluated by a prison psychologist named N.S. Hollis. Leslie was described as having average intelligence, but never well adjusted. He was a playboy and egocentric. He functions on a childish level with strong antisocial attitudes. Wow. According to the doctor, Leslie was pampered early in life and became a problem early on, always managing to get by until he was finally disciplined by the army. He also described Leslie's thinking as superficial. So just not complex, not very deep, just kind of... In the moment. In the moment, okay. Never considering the big picture or weighing options. So by 22... He has done all these things, escaped from multiple facilities run by uh, multiple sets of authorities, both civil and military. And uh, he's just, I mean, what the hell, dude? I know. That's a lot. It's, like I said, it's just such a wild story. I felt like we had to cover this. The doctor also noted that Leslie's deep rebellion against authority was tied to his emotional immaturity. Hugh O'Brien, director of the Indiana Division of Corrections, described Leslie as, quote, a fast-talking, shining personality one minute and a killer the next. Another psychiatrist called Leslie a, quote, definite psychopathic creature who also had, quote, a messiah complex. Yet, despite these ideas about Leslie, he was never ordered to undergo any type of treatment. Yeah, so you got this crazy, impulsive guy who has a God complex. Sounds like a recipe for a disaster. In spite of his charm, Leslie was placed in confinement over seven times for violating prison rules. Although he misbehaved, his infractions were mostly minor. He would take bets on the Indy 500 and make Raisin Jack liquor. Okay. Whatever that is. Using sugar he had taken from the kitchen. I wonder how Raisin Jack felt about licking her. And then sharing the moonshine with his buddies. He told prison officials, quote, I was just trying to have a little fun. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. I don't know why you guys keep making all these rules in here in prison. It's kind of lame. So I'm just going to do what I want. He just, I mean, he's like poison. He just like, you know, he don't need nothing but a good time, Dylan. <laughs> it's true. You know? Yeah. Why He doesn't understand why these people are trying to drag him down. He unsuccessfully applied for parole five times. In January of 1954, his sixth attempt at parole was successful. A bakery owner in his hometown of Evansville had agreed to employ him as a term of his parole. Leslie's brothers worked at the Lincoln Bakery for years, so it's likely the owner was trying to perform a kindness for his two loyal employees by bringing on their their shipbird brother. Yeah. Leslie managed to put on a facade for his parole officer, Burt Miller, and displayed no outward signs of trouble. So by all accounts, he was living at parents' house, doing the work thing, keeping his nose clean. So I got all my wild ways behind me. I'm finally trying to figure it out and be normal. Or be a productive citizen, rather. Right. Okay, so but the, he's not, really. He's well, just... we're going to get into that. At the time of his release, he had served nine years of the sentence... Now 30 years old, Leslie had nothing to show for his adult life and moved back into his parents' house. Mr. Irvin had worked hard doing manual labor his whole life. He had spent the last few years working at a glass factory until his health failed. Leslie's mother was often unwell. Friends would say the other Irvin children were supportive and law-abiding, but the troubled Leslie really brought added pressure to the family. And though Leslie did seem to love his parents, it never quite registered to him the sadness or the shame that his crimes brought them. Well, that doesn't surprise me. He, he doesn't strike me as someone who cares what other people think or their feelings. And no matter what Leslie was doing, he always seemed to be looking for trouble. 
Some who knew him, like a local bartender, thought Leslie was a quite charming gentleman. Others thought him a nice young man from a poor but hardworking family. Some said he was the politest man you ever saw. And others gushed that he really had a wonderful personality. That's interesting. For a killer to be able to have such a warm or the appearance of a warm personality. Leslie, who did frequent Evansville bars, was never drunk, loud, and didn't consume whiskey. He would stop in the bars to buy takeout beers a few times a week, and he would sometimes sit down to socialize for a bit. But he was mostly a beer drinker. They never saw him get rowdy. He's like Dahmer. Never tried to fight anybody. Never tried to take photos of anybody. (laughs) He never asked anybody over for beer and photos. People's like, God almighty, we thought we'd never hear you guys say that dumb shit again since you're done with Dahmer. Around 11 p.m. on December 2nd, 1954, Mary Holland was alone in the Bell Mead liquor store that she and her husband co-owned with his father, a man named Timeline Foster. Doc was Mary's husband. That was his nickname. He worked at the Ellen and Railroad and was likely nearing the end of his shift. He was an assistant yard master. And I just know that you're weird and probably would think that was a cool job. Well, it sounds like a cool job. See, I knew it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to su- assume in that line of progression of jobs that's uh, once you're yard master, dude, you've you've arrived, you know, because you're the master of the yard. Honk, you know, honk. yes. People were stocking up for Christmas entertainment, so Mary had a good day. She had been busy with customers and a newly delivered batch of Sterling beer, which was locally brewed. Mary was starting to work on the inventory. Like, she had this whole batch of beer she had to put away. Damn, they're way ahead of their time. In the night, yeah. With the small batch local brewery. Doc drove to the liquor store to help his wife close up for the night. He expected that she would be tired. Mary was pregnant. She was due in the summer. She had been on her feet since 5 p.m. So, by now, he's thinking, you know, she's got to be exhausted. Good guy, right? When he walked into the store, he didn't see his wife, but was not alarmed. He called out her name, but got no response. Figuring she was in the stock room, not hearing him, Doc walked down to the cash register. It sounds like he kind of walked down an aisle, and then there's like the counter and the cash register. And that's when he saw an open bottle of Calvert's whiskey, like sitting on the counter, which was weird. Yeah. His pregnant wife's not drinking whiskey. The register was open and empty. Mary's purse had been dumped out on the floor and her billfold was gone. Three dimes were lying in the aisle. Three dimes? Three dimes. Okay. Now consumed with fear, he called out for his wife again. Near the back of the store, Doc approached the washroom and flicked on a dim light. His wife was slumped on the floor in a kneeling position with her hands tied behind her back and her head was leaning against the wall. Her body was wedged between the toilet and the wall. She didn't respond to his voice, and when he reached to touch her, he realized blood was covering her face. Doc thought his wife had been savagely beaten during a robbery, so he immediately ran to telephone police and get an ambulance. When officers arrived at the scene, they were able to determine that Mary had, in fact, been attacked physically, but that was not the cause of death. A 38 caliber bullet had passed through her right temple and gone out the other side. The bullet now embedded into the wall. So she was beaten and then executed, basically. The 33-year-old expectant mother was taken to Baptist Hospital where she was pronounced dead. The amount of money taken was estimated to be somewhere around $150 to $250. That, yeah, that's... I don't, there's something so cowardly about a robbery like this when you see people running gas stations, liquor stores, or whatever. It's just like that person's down there working, whether whether they are the owner or just employee, working their shift, you know, doing their part. And uh, you just run in there and expect to just take whatever you want. You know, I, I don't know. I just view that as very, very cowardly for some reason. It is, Dylan. Okay. Thank you. 29-year-old Whitney Wesley Kerr was a veteran of two wars, both World War II and Korea, and he had served as a paratrooper during the Battle of the Bulge. He married his wife Peggy in 1949, and they had two children together. 
The couple had only moved to Evansville recently, like in the last couple of months. Wesley had taken odd jobs to make ends meet until something more permanent came along. He was hired to work the late shift at Barnett Standard Oil, a full-service station near Fairs Avenue in East Franklin. Shortly before midnight on December 22nd of 1954, Wesley had spoken to his wife, Peggy. They were planning to travel to Dayton, Tennessee to visit Wesley's family for Christmas, so they were making plans and discussing the trip. Now in the early morning hours, a car pulled into the lot. A driver... As he's pulling in, he sees a man in an overcoat open the door and step outside. Assuming it's the gas attendant, the driver tells him to stay inside. He's like, I just want to go buy a soda from the machine. There's no reason for you to come out into the cold, like go back in the building and stay warm because it's a pretty chilly night. The attendant waved and returned inside where he watched the customer from a glass window. The customer saw the man in the overcoat as he's getting his drink, kind of walk out of the building while stuffing what appeared to be a wallet into his pocket. Only a few minutes later, a man named William Co- uh, William Cooper was walking home from work. He was at the Chrysler plant and was making his way home when he decided to stop in at the filling station to chew the fat with his buddy Wesley. They had this uh, kind of a you know routine or whatever where when Cooper would get off work, the Chrysler factory, he would walk to the gas station, go in, hang out with his buddy. Just shoot the shit. Shoot the shit for 20, 30 minutes, warm up, and then finish the rest of his walk. Because it was was cold, Dylan. Well, sounds like a good routine. You can get you some coffee. It was chilly. You can get the the latest gossip from the neighborhood, and then take your little punk ass home. Cooper entered into the warm filling station waiting for a moment. He called out for Wes, but didn't get an answer. After a few seconds, he walked around the counter, preparing to call out again when he saw down the short hallway. There were a pair of legs stretched out from the bathroom area, like leading into the hall. William ran to the door and looked in. His friend Wesley was lying over the toilet. Fresh blood ran down the wall and toilet, and it was pooling onto the floor. Police estimated the station had been robbed between 1.30 and 1.45 a.m., A customer came forward to say Wesley had pumped his gas at 1.30 a.m., but when William Cooper arrived at about 1.45, Wesley was dead. That gave only about a 15-minute window for the assailant, which was a pretty short time for the robbery, murder, and getaway to occur without being seen. Yeah, that's a lot. I mean, you could do it, I guess, depending on how it happened. But uh, that's it. That's interesting if they can narrow it down to a 15- to 20-minute window. Because that's a very small window, and a lot of times they can't do that. Police determined the murder was very close to the one of Mary Holland. Wesley was killed in a bathroom. He had been forced to kneel with his wrists tied behind his back and was killed execution style with a thirty eight caliber weapon, though he was shot in the back of the head, not in the temple, like Mary. There was no obvious sign of a struggle. He had not been beaten. He only had that gunshot wound. So it was a little different than the Mary Holland case. Hearing the news on the radio, the man who had stopped in for the soda turned around, went back to the filling station to talk to police. He told them about a man he had seen wearing a gray coat that he thought was the attendant. Wesley was wearing his own winter coat. So they determined this guy hadn't taken Leslie's or Wesley's coat. This man you know, this gray coat was obviously like his personal coat. Um, this The witness was able to give a description to police, but he hadn't really been close enough to get a good look at the person. I mean, he just was like a dark-haired guy wearing a gray coat. Okay. Based on register receipts, the assailant had only gotten away with about $68. Police did find three dimes near the counter. Again with the three dimes. It suggested a link to Mary Holland once again, which that murder had only occurred about three weeks before. So, yeah, the three dimes. It's pretty weird, huh? Well, yeah, that would stand. Well, if your first thought was going to be somebody dropped three dimes and they're just happened to be there. But now here it is again. So that, that seems like something cops would find uh, rather intriguing. When the newspapers began printing the story, they called it, quote, a Chinese execution, which was a term used in the 1950s to describe someone being shot while kneeling. I thought they was going to call him the 30-cent killer. 
You know, that's not a good name. Sure, Dylan. Yeah, well, I'm sticking with that. Put that in the description of this show. As Heather tells us about the 30 cent killer. Residents were consumed with fear. Gun sales and locksmiths stayed busy. Most people, including teenagers, didn't want to go out after dark. Neighbors put together rotating schedules of local men who would do security patrols. The murders were called the Mystery of the Kneeling Corpses. What the hell? Barbershops buzzed with theories. The city of Evansville offered $1,000 for information leading to the killer. Okay, I love that you're just staring at me. Oh, no, I, I'm, I'm trying to process. I don't want to miss anything. It's, you know, if I start thinking about too many things, I'll, I'll miss <laughs> details. So I'm keeping, I'm keeping it clear in here. Can you tell? He's just staring at me with a blank face, you guys. In rural Posey County, Indiana, resided John and Wilhelmina Sailor on a large farm. Wilhelmina took care of the house and the couple's seven-year-old son while her husband John worked the farm. Their other two children had died as infants, so they only had this seven-year-old boy. It was March 21st of 1955, and there was a lot of work to be done in preparation for the spring planting. So everybody's busy. John had come home for lunch around 1 p.m., and when he left the house, his wife was washing dishes in the kitchen. Uh, little little John. Little Johnny. Little John, John Jr. He rode a bus home from elementary school and reached the farmhouse by 4.15. Everything seemed normal from outside, but when the young boy entered the living room, his mother was lying face down on the floor. Her hands were bound behind her back, tied tightly with the apron she had been wearing. Wow. Drawers were pulled out. Shelves were in disarray. The house, I mean, it was just completely ransacked. Among the mess, the boy saw a pool of blood. Uh, I think being tied up and, and, like, captured in your home would be so scary. Yes. So freaking scary. Because, I mean, it's all horrible, and, and it's all bad in its own ways. But, like, if you're, like, a surprise and attacked and killed, and that's just the end of it um, as far as you being alive or suffering. Um, but just being tied up there while they do whatever, you hear them talking, and maybe one of them wants to kill all the witnesses, and one of them's trying to talk you out of it, talk them out of it. And it's just, uh, it just seems torturous. It seems exactly, it seems extra horrible. I think why movies like The Strangers, while they resonate, and funny games, yes. Both those movies just like sort of fucked me up. Mm -hmm. I was like, Ooh, you don't like movies horrible like that. Anxiety. I don't like home invasion. The thought of being tied up yep. in your own. The sanctuary of her own home. Yeah. It's supposed to be a safe space. We just like being tied up with your apron string. Was, you know? Ugh. That's fucked up. It's very scary. Okay. Very scary. So only about five minutes later, John Sr. arrives. And as he's pulling into the garage, his son runs outside screaming, Mommy's on the floor and won't get up. That has to be horrible words to hear from your kid. Yeah, you may be like, oh my God, it's been an accident or something. Maybe the first thing that comes to your mind, but still very worried. Well, John runs into the house and he stumbles upon this bloody scene. His injured wife was not breathing. He realizes she's gone. Uh, shaking, he calls the Mount Vernon police. The Sailor family was gathered together as police relayed that Wilhelmina had been killed in the same way as two victims in Evansville only about three months before. A relative who lived only a short distance up the road reported seeing a dark-colored sedan leaving the sailor's residence around 2 p.m. A man in a dark-colored suit was also seen by this relative getting into the car. Police narrowed down the time of, you know, death at the time the murder occurred as sometime between 2 and 4.15 p.m. Wilhelmina's clothing was in some dishevelment, Police noted her underwear had been removed. However, a doctor's examination showed she had not been raped or sexually assaulted in any way. Mr. Saylor could not say if anything in particular was missing, save for some change that had been in a drawer. Wow, so they don't they don't have any real why this happened. No motive, no no not a lot of information. It's very weird. On March 28th of 1955, in rural Henderson, Kentucky, 20-year-old Raymond Duncan had the day off from work. His wife, Mary Alice, had given birth to their son the night before. Raymond, his father, Goble. 
Interesting name. I know, right? His mother, Mamie, his sister-in-law, Mary Elizabeth, who was married to his brother, Doris, and their two-year-old daughter, Shirley, were all going to the hospital in the city of Henderson to see the new baby. The Duncans owned about 150 acres of tobacco farm. The older couple lived in the family's farmhouse, while Raymond and his wife had a second home about a quarter mile away from the main house. A neighbor saw the father and son passing by on Trig Turner Road, headed northwest toward Geneva. Raymond was waving both arms as if greeting the man. So the neighbor's just like, oh, hey, buddy, and keeps driving. But then later we'll realize that Raymond waving his arms oh my God. was probably a sign of distress. Oh, no. Yeah. He's like, damn, he's excited today. How you doing, Raymond? Less than 15 minutes later, two men were driving on Trig Turner Road, passing along the fields. The passenger, a 17-year-old named Wallace Brown, gazed out the window and noticed something unusual. The young man asked the driver to pull over, thinking he might have seen a deer. Both men got out of the car and walked toward a small grove of trees. As they got closer, the pair became alarmed at what was in the muck. The lifeless bodies of Goble and Raymond were lying on the swampy ground with fresh gunshot wounds to the back of the head. Both were face down with their hands tied behind their backs. Yet again, more executions. It took some time for police to arrive. The two men were questioned and allowed to leave. The sheriff headed to the Duncan property to let Mamie know what had happened. By now, passerbys were stopping off to see what the commotion was about. A big crowd was starting to gather, and the sheriff wanted to make sure he informed the family right. before one of these, you know, looky-loos did. Well, yeah, and that's what happens. You know, the, the rumor mill and the gossipers, that it, stops, it starts almost immediately. When Sheriff Williams arrived at the house, he knocked at the screen door, but there was silence. The inner door was standing open just a bit. He nudged it further, calling out for Mamie Duncan. And that's when he entered the home, thinking, you know, maybe she just didn't hear him. And he made a shocking discovery. 19-year-old Elizabeth Duncan, Doris's wife, was found in a bedroom lying face down across the bed. A gunshot wound to the back of the head had killed her. She was naked from the waist down, her slacks and underwear folded neatly by her shoes on the floor. Her two-year-old daughter, Shirley, was sobbing and clinging to a stuffed bunny as she sat next to her mother on the blood-soaked bed. You know, it's a bit different for the the method um, to be a gunshot. Well, I know we had like, you know, Sam, uh, the Summer of Sam and all that. There have been victims and what, the Texarkana killer was using a gun as well, if I'm not mistaken. But it just seems, uh, you know, it's the typically... Zodiac. yeah. Well, oh shit, now that I say it, there's all tons of people use guns. Never mind. I thought it was a bit abnormal, but now that I've thought about it, just now thought about it, there's a lot of people that use a gun as a method of murder. Oh, well, not, I mean, I don't think that, I think I mean, you're right when I said serial, there's like a ton of serial killers who it, are shooters. Yeah, well, I typically think strangle, uh, stab. I don't know why, but yeah, I guess everybody's used uh, all kinds of stuff. Well, I'm just thinking how horrible it is for this little baby girl, two years old, to be sitting there holding her stuffed bunny, crying next to her mom. Tell my mommy won't get up. It's so sad. It's terrible. Mamie was found in the next room with a gunshot wound to her head and, and her arm, but she was still alive, thankfully. The baby Shirley was taken by an officer while Mamie was rushed to the hospital and it was the same hospital where her grandson had been born the night before. An armed guard was posted outside her door. Doris learned of his family's murder when he returned from working in the coal mines. Mary Alice, who was waiting at the hospital for a visit from the family, learned about the news while listening to a radio report. And she immediately collapsed when this happened. And that's why they try to go out of their way to get, you know, a next of kin notified before the news. People start talking. It's on the radio. Because that's got to be even worse than being contacted by authorities. None of it's good. I know. I'm but like, that's you're just listening to the... Mary Alice, like, she just had a baby. Yeah. She's had that physical 
demand put on her body for and all emotional. these months. Yeah. And then the physicality of delivering a baby and that emotional, yeah, you're right. I mean, she's probably in this heightened emotional state, hormonal, and all she's doing is just like waiting for her husband and her in-laws to come and see this brand new baby. Yeah. And then you hear on the radio, radio they've been murdered. Husband and That's his horrible. family has That's been terrible. murdered. Terrible. Yeah, it's so horrible. Henderson County, I should mention, is directly across the Ohio River from Evansville. So it's like mere minutes away from the Twin Bridges. The similarities among the six murders was undeniable. All had been bound with hands behind their backs and shot with 38 calibers to the head. Matching reports about a dark-haired man in a dark-colored sedan showed up at both the Sailor and Duncan crime scenes, but didn't offer any helpful leads for police. Again, residents were freaking out, locking their doors, buying guns, being extra cautious. Mamie was still in the hospital, alive, but unfortunately permanently blinded. Oh, my gosh. Although she was unable to attend the funerals for her son and husband, nearly 1,500 residents and neighbors attended. No surprise. Shocking crime. Whole, whole, whole communities, you know, dealing with it. News of the triple murder spread like wildfire. Police went from door to door talking to neighbors. You know the old saying, you don't know what you may know, was being applied to the situation as they were asking if neighbors had seen anything out of the ordinary on the day of the murders or just what had you seen that day? You don't know what you don't know. Is that the saying? You don't know what you may know. Okay. Yeah. I had this guy training me at work one time and he kept saying, I don't know what you don't know. And I was like thinking to myself, well, I don't fucking know what I don't know either because I don't even know. What what I'm I don't know. What does that even mean? That sounds like something that you would say. Just I no, I didn't say it. They he said it. I'm saying it. though. Yeah. I'm saying. I don't know what I don't know. That sounds like something you would say. Because I don't know what I'm supposed to know. So just Boy, train that's me. That's the damn truth. Just train me, bruh. That answer, I don't know what I'm supposed to know, is the most Dylan admission of all time. It is it is what it is. They will or they won't. I mean, these are sayings that I've lived my life by. And I think they can help anyone. I'm going to start a philosophy. It's called don't sweat the small stuff. Even if it's going to turn into big stuff. Don't worry about it right now. You can worry about that tomorrow. Make the most of this moment by doing nothing. You're giving me such anxiety. (laughs) Just by myself. This is the worst (laughs) advice ever. Oh, what was that last one? I can never follow any of this advice. Don't worry about it. Make the most of now by doing nothing. You know? You know, just worry about that later. How am I married to you? I don't know. Could you we would, be any more different? You could not live. We're <laughs> similar in some ways, but you could not live by some of the tenets of Dylanism, Dylanistas, or whatever my religion's called. No, just living with you who mm. practices those tenets? Dilihama. Is That's enough it. to have me on edge mm-hmm. most days. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, she likes structure, folks. It's like having another child in the house. Okay. That makes money. Okay. So I have to give you a little leeway. Yeah, and, and that is <laughs> one of the key concepts of Dilly Lama is um, giving me more le- leeway. You're the great Dilly Lama? <laughs> yeah. Home. Okay. I am Dilly Lama. You gave me a blessing. I have that going for me, I guess. Yeah, just let me breathe this cigarette mouth breath on you. Okay. You're going to be blessed. It's like the in, the incense is just cigarette smoke. <laughs> just my cigarette breath. All right, enough. <laughs> A few had reported seeing Goble and Raymond talking to two different men earlier in the day by their driveway. A car was spotted down the road a little way from the Duncan's home in a strange place where no one ever parked. The neighbor thought maybe it was someone who had simply ran out of gas or had car trouble. And the neighbor described it as a dark colored sedan with some damage to the left side. The license plate was from Indiana, though the neighbor didn't jot it down. Mrs. Virginia Griffin called in a report that she and two other residents of Sturgis, Kentucky, thought they had information that might help. She had been traveling to Evansville by way of Henderson County with her grandchildren on the morning of March 28th. 
It was around 9.40 a.m. that she was involved in a minor fender bender with a dark colored sedan. Mrs. Griffin said the man insisted they not report the accident to police. So she paid him $5 for damages and went on her way. Wow. $5. Nice. So she was at fault for the accident, but the man insisted, we don't need cops. We can take care of this. Well, I don't know if she was at fault or not. It just said she was involved in this fender bender. Oh, but I mean, she gave him money for uh, damages. Well, I guess she was. I mean, I don't know. Okay. Well, no, I, I, I just uh, what I'm saying. If someone that's even more strange, if she was at fault for the accident, for this guy to insist on not using um, authorities, you know, that was. Well, st- I had an accident recently, and I was not at fault, but I still gave the lady my insurance information. Yeah, and then she tried to do crawl dad your ass. No, and then they denied her because they watched the camera and saw that she was at fault. But see, I wasn't being an asshole, so I gave her my info. I would give her like uh, false information. I would be like, it's clown insurance. My agent's name's Bobo. You know what I mean? <laughs> Here's the number, 888-888-888. Yeah, I know, and all this stuff is real information. www.clowninsurance.com. Are you done? Yep. Okay, so... Mrs. Griffin was unnerved when the driver turned around after their interaction and started following her. Oh, that would weird me out. He followed her for some time, but then turned into a driveway about two miles from the accident site. The police now are looking for this dark colored sedan because they've had three corroborating descriptions of this dark colored vehicle with damages. Oh, wow. That had been near the Duncan property. Another witness said the man was probably about six feet tall, stocky, clean-shaven, with dark hair and eyes, and that he was dressed neatly in a suit, but not fancy. (laughs) I love that, neat but not fancy. It's just regular. Before the Duncan murders in January of 1955, the sheriff of Vanderburg County had noticed an extremely large number of break-ins in the area. Mostly, the thieves were stealing guns, cash, and jewelry. Now, he didn't know at the time, but similar burglaries were occurring in at least three neighboring counties. So, it's almost like this theft ring. Oh, wow. Like some burglary ring, right? Yeah, they're burgling everybody. After weighing in on how to eliminate the crimes, the sheriff created a junior patrol that he called Schoolboy Patrol, in which youth members were given badges and patches. This was something that was kind of happening across the country. This sounds dangerous. Well, they're just given like little junior patrol badges. Okay. They're like fucking 11, Dylan. I think most people would know that an 11-year-old with a badge is not a real cop. (laughs) I mean, I get that you're kind of (laughs) stupid. And if a child came up to you and was like, sir, are you drinking and driving? That you would get out. I don't answer questions. You would get out of the vehicle and and do your sobriety test. And you would let this like seven-year-old take you to jail. He's on like a scooter. Most people, right, have enough common sense to know that the schoolboy patrol is not a real Officer Dylan. Well, I thought you were going to say they had them out there like looking for the killer. And I just thought that was inappropriate. <laughs> if you'll Let's... shut up, I'm going to tell you about the schoolboy patrol. Okay. Okay. They were instructed to focus on staying alert and report any unusual activity in their neighborhoods. So like if you see something, report it. They are using them. See something, say something. Exactly. Yeah. Like, hey, if you see a creepy weird guy... Dressed in all black, wearing a bandit mask, and he's climbing out of a bathroom window of your neighbor's house. You right. should probably call us. Yeah, but don't be deploying spike strips from your bicycles. It's too much. Well, by April, this club had over 600 members. Wow. So kids in the community were, like, really into it. It was on March 30th that the four Pierman brothers, ranging in ages from 12 up to 18 along with some of their buddies, decided to go out for a ride. A new oil well was being drilled nearby in a field not too far away, and they wanted to go check it out, which sounds like something that you would want to go check out. They wanted to go look at the equipment. They did. Yeah. About 200 yards from the the Pierman family home, which is on Vienna Road, the boys saw a dark colored sedan parked near some trees. Not seeing anyone around at first, they joked it was the murderer's abandoned car. 
12-year-old Russell Pierman was eager to begin his work with the schoolboy patrol and wanted to report something. He wrote down the tag number. As the boys got closer to the vehicle so Russell could write down the number, a man sort of appeared out of the woods and got into the car. He was probably making a pit stop since there was nothing nearby. This is what the boys reasoned. He's making the pee-pees. Yeah, yeah, he had to go, you know, he had to go pee or whatever. Now, on a lark, one of the boys yelled out the window, We're investigators! (laughs) Oh my, to the guy? That's when the driver cranked the car and immediately sped off with gravel flying, leaving the other car full of boys in this dust cloud. So they were just like, what the hell? Um, Gary Pierman noted damage to the front left fender. It was about two days later that brother Alan Pierman read a newspaper article about the sedan with damage that law enforcement was looking for this vehicle. Indiana plates. Oh, so they don't know all that information. So it's just a weird event that happened to them, and they just thought it was kind of weird and goofy. Yes. Okay. It was the exact match to the car they had seen earlier. Alan took the newspaper to his mother, and his little brother Russell hounded her to report the tag number to police. Finally, Mrs. Pierman, just like over listening to her kids, <laughs> just decided to get them to shut up. Yes, she would appease them and call the cops. The vehicle came back as a 1947 black Chevrolet registered to Leslie Irvin, a convicted criminal who was out on parole from the Indiana State Prison. Sheriff McDonald would later credit the eight teenagers with breaking the case for reporting what they had seen. So the schoolboy patrol worked. Yeah, and here you were shit-talking the schoolboy patrol. I wasn't shit-talking it. I just thought it would, you know, what if they get in trouble? What if they get in some kind of See, a... See, you're, you're the same attitude that would try to bring, like, the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew down. Like, oh, because they're kids, they can't be investigators. <laughs> you guys shouldn't be out here investigating murderers and dangerous criminals. You could get hurt. It worked for the Scooby-Doo gang. Yeah. And you know that... Uh, or negative Nancy. At any time... One of those masked characters could have pulled out a gun and shot them all. So it could have happened. Well, that's it. That's not 2022, okay? That was the 70s. Oh. People just didn't do that, Dylan. Okay. Okay. An arrest came on April 8th of 1955. Irvin was working as a steam pipe asbestos insulator at Southern Indiana Gas and Electric, which was in Yankee Town. I'm sorry, I got to comment on the irony of the fact that this man is handling asbestos and all the poor people that asbestos has killed by coming into contact with it. This murderer, killer piece of shit works with asbestos and is great, but gets to keep killing. Irvin fought the arrest. He actually had to be tackled by three officers at this plant. No, oh, he cuffed. Okay. Because he's like trying to get away from them when they're arresting him. When officers looked into his work record, they found that he had not shown up for work seven Mondays in a row, including the days when Wilhelmina Sailor and the Duncan family had been killed. Oh, so it's not, they're locking this guy for it. In custody, Leslie confessed to 24 burglaries across the region and was considered the hottest suspect they had in the murders. Leslie Irvin was verified as the owner of the car seen near the Duncan farm on the day of the shootings. For the deaths of Mary Holland and Wesley Kerr, Leslie was indicted on two counts of first-degree murder on April 21st of 1955 by Vanderburg County Grand Jury. The sentence requested the death penalty. Of the two cases, Kerr's case was chosen to prosecute because of the witnesses and tangible evidence present, Both Indiana and Kentucky wanted to try him, so there ended up sort of being this back-and-forth squabble over who would take him to trial first. But ultimately, Indiana won out. Three first-degree murder charges were also in Henderson County, and that's where they wanted to extradite him, was back to Kentucky. Indiana, as I mentioned, would be the first to try him, The judge requested he first be evaluated by psychologists. Meanwhile, a Kentucky grand jury met in Henderson to consider first-degree murder charges in the case of the Duncans. Leslie was taken to Indianapolis for a lie detector test, 
it was said the results were inconclusive. The shoes he was wearing had been cleaned since the time of the murders, but police wanted to inspect them for any evidence of blood or muck. Also being tested were leather gloves that he had in his possession. And they thought maybe he had worn those. As he's breaking into the homes, uh, yeah. might have blood on them. Exactly. Ballistics showed a Smith & Wesson or similar had been used to fire on Wilhelmina Sailor. Police did find the murder weapon on April 16th. They also found fraudulent checks inside Leslie's car. He had stashed loot from his robberies in the car as well because he couldn't take these items home to his parents' house. <laughs> Another drawback of living with your parents, right? Uh, and you can't take your... Um, wait, what is that? Items from the victim? Oh, it's stuff he stole the robbery, during the robberies. Like jewelry, guns. Yeah, you can't take your stolen goods back to the house. Your mom's going to wonder where you got it from. Exactly. Because you don't have a job. The problem came when trying to seat jurors. Of 430 potential jurors, 268 were excluded for having fixed opinions. 103 were opposed to the death penalty, and so they were cut. Most of the residents received the local newspaper, which reported extensively on the murders. So, like, most of the people in town already had him pegged as guilty. Right. Right? Now, during the trial, he was led on a dog chain leash because of his past history of escaping. This earned him the nickname Mad Dog. That's funny. So a lot of people know him as like Mad Dog Leslie Irvin. He was ultimately found kill, uh, guilty of killing Wesley Kerr and sentenced to death. Irvin managed to escape from jail on January 20th of 1956 and fled west. About a month later, he was arrested in San Francisco, California, trying to pawn some stolen rings. Nice. I like how he he gets away, but he, he just goes and like robs and steals till they catch him again. In 1961, Irvin's case was heard by the Supreme Court of the United States based on the pretrial publicity. Irvin's attorneys argued he was not given an impartial jury. His conviction was reversed. Irvin was retried and convicted in June of 1962, and this time he was given life in prison. While in prison, leatherworking became his hobby. Leslie Irvin died on November 9th of 1983 from lung cancer. He was called a model prisoner while incarcerated. Oh, wow. And never managed to escape again <laughs> or just gave up. Yeah, I think he quit trying to escape, surely. Because there there was no cage that could hold him in his younger years. <laughs> right. Wow. So I've never heard anything about Mr. Leslie. Well, there you go. Irving. So do you... Th so he would uh, break into homes, tie these people up. I'm going to guess he would wait till the end to shoot them. Because, you know, gunfire's loud. You probably want to clear out afterwards. So more than likely, you went through their homes, got what valuables were easy to grab. All the while, they're tied up there wondering what they're going to do, maybe even pleading for them, their lives. And uh, then he just, you know, walks up very closely and shoots them in the head and, and leaves. That's pretty sadistic. It's pretty terrible. Yeah, it is. He's just a total fucking creep. And you see this escalation from like these sort of petty crimes. Yep. You know, stealing bicycles. Then it becomes like breaking and entering. Arson. Starting fires when he was young. And that evolves into this plan where he's just going to murder people and rob them. And that happens. You know, they, they test it out. They try new things and uh, get up the guts to try it for the first time. And I think a lot of times that's where the some of these people will get that rush, you know, from doing whatever and... And then and they just keep doing more and more, and it keeps getting worse. So I, I think that's one reason you have a you if you have a young person in your life who uh, is doing some really dumb stuff, and it just keeps to see it seems to keep getting a little bit worse, a little bit worse. It's something to be worried about, you know, because it really could be kid dumb kids doing dumb stuff. But you know, 
sometimes they'll say that about something, but it's something rather outlandish that I would never, ever, ever done in any circumstances. You know what I mean? Like breaking into people's houses, for one. I would be beside myself nervous breaking into someone's house. Would you not be? Yes. I would be just freaking out about the fact that they might pop up or there may be someone in the house. No, that's not going to work for me. I could never do it. The vandalizing shit. I, I never thought that was cool or funny as a kid. You know, you get around some other kids. Oh, let's go do this or whatever. I'm like, no, I'm not down for that. So I respected people's property early on. Good for you. And I wonder why. I wonder why I was I, such a good kid. Because your mama probably would have. My mom would have fucked me I'm up, gonna dude. Say, Miss Kathy probably would have like, <laughs> thrown a shoe at you or something. Yeah, I did not need anybody contacting my mama about shit. So when things got hairy, I got gone. I went home. She wanted you to get somewhere and get still. That's right. Right. So this is an interesting, since we're talking about Leslie, I told you his hobby was leather working. So while he was in prison, he became this very talented leather craftsman, and he would fashion billfolds, belts, purses, and a lot of other items that were sold in the prison store. Really? So inmates could buy these items and give them to relatives for gifts and things. That's crazy. Damn, could you imagine... Um, having one of those and not knowing where it came from. Yeah. That'd be kind of so weird. weird, huh? Yeah. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of Mountain Murders. Leslie looked like an asshole. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yes, thank you for listening. And uh, thank you, Heather, for that story. I Yet- will post some photos of Leslie on Instagram. Yet another. Um, you can follow us at Appalachian True Crime on Instagram. Yet another old story that I'd never heard before, and I do appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you, Heather. Thank you for all your hard work. You're welcome. Can I tell everyone how hard this little lady's been working lately? Just full time, all the time, day and night. And uh, she's still trying to crank out these Mountain Murders episodes. And uh, I really appreciate you. I just want everyone to know that I think you're awesome. Thank you. All righty. I took Dylan to my company Christmas party last night. He didn't embarrass me too much. I would, didn't, and I met a bunch of great people. So I had a great time. You did? Yeah, yeah, I think you I'm were. I'm so glad. Um, I'm not saying this because someone may possibly listen to this later down the road. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. You know, a couple of them do. But no, mm-hmm. they, they really were, uh, which, you know, uh, I'm always weirded out meeting a big group of people I don't know, and you 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 kind of just met these people for the most part, you know, some you know month, couple months or whatever. Um, but I thought they were great and an interesting bunch, and uh, yeah, had a blast. Funeral people are fun, and I'm pretty sure I was. Nah, I'm not pretty sure. I'm certain that I didn't do anything stupid. And uh, yeah, all right. No, I mean you just showed up with your face, but other than that, it was fine. Man, I'm a big dumb face. <laughs> <laughs> I did oversleep this morning. I was up a little no, bit too late. I have to say, we got to play some rounds of Christmas bingo. That was fun. I was really fucking into it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? Like, I, I've not played bingo in forever, but like after about like the first game, I was like, hell yeah, bring it on. Bring on the gingerbread cookies. You was trying to win, bro. Bring on the garland, the Christmas tree. I got yeah. this little Santa free square. I was into it. I yeah. Was, Bingo's fun. Why are we not playing bingo? And then we did that where you like, pat, you listen to the little poem or whatever, you pass the presents left and right. Um, at first, I was like, this is pretty corny, folks. What are we doing? But it was actually fun. Uh, I mean, I had fun, and I thought that was a fun thing to That's do. That's the thing. You just have to, like... Do something different. You have to, like, let yourself enjoy the y- moment. Though. Yeah, because you do. Because I'm telling you, I enjoyed playing Christmas bingo. Right. I almost feel like we need to play some version of that with the kids or something. Uh, we can, you know. I want to, like, go to a bingo hall and play, like, bingo. I want to find some 85-year-old grandmother because I called bingo out, but I didn't have one. Do you know that is the one thing they'll have them down there ready to fight you at the bingo hall? Yeah, I've heard. If you call out a bingo and you don't have a bingo. I've heard stories. They don't play around. Someone actually suggested um, just going there and people watching. Who? Yeah, I That'd think it was a An- Yeah, I think it was Anthony last night cuz we were talking about bingo and he said that you should just go and people watch and watch cuz you know we were talking about the very serious 
bingo players. Like the professional bingo players. They get out. They've got like 30 cards. They got like 30 cards. They got their good luck charms. They got their little space outline. They have all their little ink stampers. They have all their different They're like colored. double fisting ink stampers. They are playing fucking like 10 or 15 cards at once. Yeah. Which is amazing skill. I was having a hard time keeping up with three cards last night. It was tricky. I don't think, I don't, we just don't have it like that. Like Gladys and them. Okay, go to podcastcalendars.com to secure your true crime podcast calendar. These calendars are on sale right now. And if you use the promo code Mountain Murders, you're going to get $5 off the regular price. Mine's going to be here in a couple of days and I can't wait. Podcastcalendars.com. Get your 2023 true crime podcast calendar. Support yes. Mountain Murders and the 11 other true crime podcasts that have joined. To bring you this amazing calendar. Support Indie Pods because that's where the coolest ones are. It's true, Dylan. All right. So till next time. Yeah. Just, um, I don't know, hang out with your wang out, right? Yeah, pull it out. When in doubt, whip it out. Yeah, I get it. But just like be careful who you do that in front of. Squeeze it. Because it could be like illegal. Yeah. Okay, bye. Make sure.